It shapes our world. What power do we really have? Does it come with incredible wealth or with a position of governance? There is a power that comes from God. A power that enables. A power that changes lives forever. The power of grace. Hey, look, this morning we're talking about uh, the power of grace. And um, to me, this is a particularly important message. Um, To understand grace is more than understanding just the nature of God's way in which he forgives us. It's, It's actually a shift in our whole relationship with God that occurred during the first century. And to me, this is one of the most powerful messages you could ever hear. If I was to be asked what would be your top two or three messages that you would like to bring to an audience, uh, this is one of them. And uh, I trust that you'll be able to follow this through today. So I know it's uh, earlier than normal. I know you've all got out of bed an hour earlier. uh, And it's very easy just to be still half asleep. But I really encourage you this morning to to, uh, engage your brains. Uh, This PowerPoint that I'm using this morning is already up online, so you'll be able to pick it up there, because I'm using quite a bit of scripture this morning to help us understand this this important transition that occurred between an Old Testament and a New Testament. What is it that Jesus did, how did he do it, and how does Paul record it for us? So, um, let me start by, get my my thing out of my pocket here. Um, Let me start by describing what we already know, and that is that the Bible is made up of a a New Testament and an Old Testament, okay? So your Bible will be like mine. It'll have this split in there where we've got the Old Covenant that was made with the people of Israel, and then Jesus being from the nation of Israel, Jesus being a Jew, when he came in and he linked these two parts of Scripture together with his own life. Now, The important thing to note is that grace existed in the Old Testament times, and I'll explain why that's the case. It's quite simple. God made a way for us to be reconciled with him through the keeping of the Old Testament law. And it's this this Old Testament law that is our starting place this morning. So I just want to remind you of the simplicity of what the Old Testament law looked like. Let's just go to Deuteronomy, and you'll find in one chapter there a really simple explanation of how keeping the rules, keeping the law, built you into a relationship with God, and it offered you a grace. Let's read this. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the cows of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. Okay? That's pretty simple, isn't it? Be good, be blessed. Okay? Be good, be blessed. Further on the chapter, it says, However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all the commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. You'll be cursed in the city, cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed. And the crops of your land and the cows of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You'll be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. Okay? Pretty simple stuff, isn't it? Sounds a little bit like raising a four-year-old, doesn't it? You be good, life will go well for you. You be bad, and your life will consist of your bedroom. And that will be it, all right? So it's a very, very simple relationship, but it was built built around obeying the law. And for the sake of today, I want you to imagine yourself as first century Jews, okay? Because this is the context in which these, these scriptures were written. And it's really important for you today to imagine that you're a people who have lived by this book, this Old Testament book, and now you're going through a transition. And this transition is so vitally important. Because remember, 
the law as we see it here in the Old Testament, Jesus affirmed it. He didn't do away with it, he affirmed it. And I'll show you why he said, what he said there. He said, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, that's John the Baptist. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Okay, so the law is here. The law is going to stay with us. Okay, and Jesus conf confirmed and affirmed that the law that was given through Moses is not going to pass away. It's not going to die. It is here to stay. Okay, so here we have a bit of a tension because we've got an Old Testament law we told, we're told is going to continue to live. And we've got a, a gospel, the good news of Jesus. So what do we do? How do we reconcile these two things? Well, one of the challenges that made the Old Testament law so hard to live by is because of our human nature. We have this predisposition to getting around the law. Uh, it's something all of us do. Um, I don't know about you, but when I drive, I drive at 104. I figure that's enough grace there for the traffic officer to go, nah, he's right, okay? Now, that's a confession. But in the Old Testament times, people were always looking for a way to fulfill the law as God gave it, but always looking for how they can just sort of manipulate their way around it. And uh, for example, on the Sabbath, which is the Saturday, the holy day of worship, the Jews were told, that they could only walk 2,000 cubits away from their house. Okay, now a cubit is the distance between your finger, a male's top finger, and his elbow. All right? So at work tomorrow, when someone says how far that is, you just go, oh, 45 cubits, and no one understands what you're talking about. 2,000 cubits is around about 800 meters. Okay, so that's simple. But what people would do to get around this law, if they wanted to go and visit their friend who was two or three k's away, they would go, before the Sabbath, they'd get their servant to move 750 metres down the road and another servant further down or maybe a, a stack of their tools or something under a tree. And then the, the person could walk and say, well, I'm never more than 750 cubits away from my property. You see? Pretty tricky, huh? Eh? Pretty, pretty, pretty sly, eh? So, you know, I'm keeping the law, but I'm getting around the law. Now, there are 603 laws in the Old Testament. 603 laws. And uh, that law is the first five books of Scripture. We call it, theological terms, we call it the Pentateuch. Penta five, first five books. 603 laws which were given by Moses for the people to use to please God. Okay? The problem, however is that the Jewish community uh, built another set of laws around the laws, okay? So here we've got a law where they're saying, there's 603 laws, but I don't want you to break those, so therefore we'll build another set of laws around the original law so that you won't even get close to breaking the original law. Does that make sense? So if the law was drive at 100 miles an hour, we'll say, we're going to write you out a ticket at 80 miles an hour, all right? Because why? We want you to, to not break the law. So we'll make another set of laws. Now, to give you an example of how crazy this gets, for the keeping of the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath holy, don't work on it, um, there were another 600 laws associated with the Sabbath alone. And so, you can see how it is that this, this challenge starts to overwhelm people. 600 extra laws just concerning the Sabbath. And uh, everybody starts to sort of break the laws. Now, if you go to Jerusalem today, there's a hotel there called the King David Hotel. Makes perfect sense. You get into the hotel, you push your button. Sorry, get into the elevator, you push your button, and you go up to wherever your room is. But the elevator is programmed so that on the Sabbath, you get into the elevator and it goes up and stops at every floor. Because to push the button is creating work and you shall not work on the Sabbath. Okay, so on, on the Sabbath, it stops at every floor. 
I remember when Jesus healed the guy uh, who was blind by making mud and putting it on his eyes. He got in trouble not for healing the guy, but what he did is Jesus spat on the ground. And in doing so, he made mud. If you make mud, that's work. You see what I'm saying? All these crazy laws that protected the original law. And so these folks had this um, relationship with God through the law, but the problem is that their actions might have been doing one thing, but their hearts were far from God. And the prophets would pick this up quite regularly. Here's Isaiah saying, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. Okay, so all of these extra laws that are applied to stop you breaking the original law. It sounds like it's a nice thing to do to help people, but it just overwhelmed them, totally overwhelmed them. And so when we have this amazing event that happens at the end of Jesus' ministry where he's crucified, we read how it is that this death of Jesus has broken the back of this law. And this is where I need to explain to you how this happens, because this is a vital, vital part of understanding your own faith. Because we can be intimidated by the Old Testament. There's a lot here to be intimidated by, isn't there? What do we do with the Old Testament? We're New Testament people. But what do we do with this? Well, I'll explain to you this transition. And we're going to go to Romans 7, and we're going to look at some scriptures. And I'm guessing that a lot of you would have read the scripture and sort of thought, oh, okay, I, I get that. Or others have just moved on and not really processed it. Let me explain. Romans 7, 1 to 2 says, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, from speaking to those who know the law, the Old Testament, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. Okay, that's that's a pretty simple illustration. This isn't about marriage. The scripture isn't about marriage. It's actually about our relationship with the Old Testament law. What Paul is saying is that we've got this relationship. Each one of us here are like a married couple where we are bound to one another until death do we part. What Paul is saying to us is that we have a relationship with the law until death do we part. The problem is, Jesus says the law will never die. The law will never pass away. So we're in a bit of a dilemma, aren't we? We're going to be forever married to this law. Now, the problem with this husband called the law is that this husband, well, he owns you. If you're first century Jews, you've been raised in a Jewish covenant. Your Jewish, Jewish ancestry is all there. You are covenant people. The law owns you. The law defines your lifestyle. From the moment you get out of bed in the morning to the moment you go to sleep, everything about your life is determined by this law as well as the hundreds and thousands of other little laws that are associated around it. Uh, the problem with this law is that it will overwhelm you with demands. You got me? If you've got all these laws, you can't barely put a foot down anywhere without some law kicking into being about how you dress, how you eat, how you worship, how you raise your family. And, and the other thing about your law, the law is that it will provoke you to feelings of inadequacy. You are always going to be feeling as if you don't make it. Uh, there's this sort of a yoke, if you like, a yoke of slavery upon you, yeah, where you're just bound to this law. And that's why Jesus said that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, all ye who are laden and heavy heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. I got that around the wrong way. Um, And the thing about this law, this Old Testament law, is that it will always intimidate you. Always intimidates you. It always just looks like a huge mountain that you've got to climb every day. But it gets worse. The worst thing about your husband, the law, is that he only speaks 
when he's offended. He only speaks when he's offended. Now, the thing about this Old Testament law is that it's silent until you do something wrong. Then it wakes up and says, I can see that you're not making the grade. And that's the nature of law, isn't it? Have you ever been down to the police station and said, I'd just like to tell you about my neighbour. He's been going down the street doing all these random acts of kindness. Is there anything you can do about that? The police are going to go, no, nothing we've got to say about that. Because we only speak when the law is broken. So if you went down to the police station and said, my neighbour is breaking into everybody's house down the street, the police would go, yep, now you'll hear from us. Because the law only speaks when it's offended. The law only speaks when it is broken. Uh, you know, when we watch a rugby game um, and, and people are playing the game, kicking the ball, passing the ball, and there's a referee on the paddock, he only blows the whistle when someone makes a mistake, right? You don't see it this happen. You don't see Bowden Barrett do this wonderful kick and he goes, hey, stop, stop. Did you see that? That was outstanding, wasn't it? You notice how he got the ball, had plenty of time, perfectly timed kick, bounced on the line and out. That was really good. Eh? All the teams would go, what? See, the law only speaks when it's offended. <clears throat> and again, your husband, the law, doesn't lift a finger to help you. Now, don't dig your elbow into your husband right now, okay? <laughs> We're not talking about marriage, okay? But the law never encourages you. The law is silent. It won't help you. And the difficulty is that you're stuck with him. Yeah? This is your husband, the law. You're stuck with him. The law that will never pass away. So now we've got a dilemma. I've created a dilemma for us here, okay? And this is really important for us to see this dilemma. And overwhelmingly, another challenge that we face about the law is that your law, your, sorry, your conscience is a servant of the law. Do you find that your conscience never speaks to you in a way that goes, are oh, you doing really good? Your conscience more often than not will say, you should do better. You should do better. Whenever you do some painting and you slip your little brush up on the corner there, you have the whole room. Amazing. But your eye will go to the little bit there. I know. Yeah? Yeah. So your conscience, the law, is always telling you that you've got to do better. And so how do we overcome this? Well, let's have a look at what Romans says to us. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, from speaking to those who know the law, we've just read this, that the law is authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. But the law will never die. Carry on halfway down there, verse 3. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Now, that second to last line there is probably one of the most important lines in the whole of the New Testament, because it severs, it breaks the old covenant. Why? Because when Christ died on the cross, he credited to me and you the death that he died. So now we've got this relationship with the law and, and you're stuck with this law until death separates you. Now death has separated you. By putting your faith in Christ, you have been gifted the death of Jesus. That's what Paul is saying. You've been gifted the death of Jesus. And now it is no longer you who, I who live, but Christ who lives within me. 
The good news is that your old husband, the law, sorry, you died to your old husband, the law. And, and this is where the New Testament actually begins. This is the starting place for this whole new covenant, is that you no longer have an obligation to the law because your marriage to the law is over. You're now set free from the law because Christ died for you and he has credited that death to you because he didn't deserve to die. There's a free death waiting to be used, so to speak. A free death that's on credit. And we, by faith, appropriate that. We, by faith, accept that. And now we are in Christ. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, Christ Jesus. And I'll keep unpacking this. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Okay, you with me? The law of sin and death is the Old Testament. But you have been set free because of Christ's death credited to you. Well, let, uh, let Romans put it another way. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. Now I'll keep this verse going. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, you, when you read this stuff, normally you just go, blah, 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 and you move on. <laughs> Why? Because some of this marriage and law stuff is really quite, quite confusing. So what happened to your marriage to the law? It's over because you died. When you accept by faith that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, you have received by faith the death that he was made to pay, the price he was made to pay. So you have appropriated that death so that you can die to your old husband, the law. Now, this was really, really important for first century Jews. They were like, well, how do I leave this old covenant and how do I become a Christian? Well, you've got to accept that the old covenant has now been fulfilled in Jesus and that death has been credited to you so that you can move on into a new marriage. A new marriage. Because only through death do you get the chance to make a new marriage work. So Jesus died and you died with him. You now have a new marriage. Now listen to what Galatians says about this. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Does this make sense now? But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. What Paul is saying here, if we could have attained a right relationship with God through this Old Testament then Jesus didn't need to die. But we couldn't. We could keep laws, but the Old Testament law never captured our heart. It would capture our actions. It would capture the little lawyer inside all of us that tried to scoot around the law so that we could uh, live a life apart from the law. Okay, so now we've created a whole new set of problems. This wasn't the end of the story. We've got a whole new set of problems because we now got to ask the question, if all of these thousands of laws, the Torah and the Mishnah, no longer applies to me, how do I live? Who makes the rules? What do we do? It's like a young adult's left home has been given a million bucks and just been plonked in the middle of Wellington. Mum and dad have gone. What do I do? How do I live? The rules have all disappeared. I have a freedom now from the obligations of the law. And this was a real tension in the first century church. And I want to take you to the middle of the book of Acts 
Acts chapter 15. And we have a really, really important council meeting of the apostles and the church leaders of the time. They were being presented with a problem. The problem was the kingdom of God was expanding beyond the Jews to include all these other people, the Samaritans and the Gentiles, which is good news because that's what this covenant's all about. It's about Christ for the whole world. But they've got a problem. There were people who were saying, oh, no, 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 some of these Gentiles, we've got to make sure that they fulfill the old law of Moses. And others were saying, no, no, hold on. They don't have to do that. Okay, so what should they do then? We need to have a meeting. We've got to be Baptists. Okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> here it is. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch. Certain people. The certain people are the legalists. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Oh. Now, circumcision is a code word for the whole law, okay? It's not just the physical act of circumcision. It's a code word for the, keeping the Old Testament law. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The question is, what should the Gentiles who are coming to faith in Jesus what should they be doing about the Old Testament law? They've never kept the law. They don't even know the law because they weren't raised with the law. They had no relationship with the law at all. And next thing, they've got this, this encumbrance, if you like, of all of these laws being thrust upon them by a group of legalists who say, you've got to keep the law as well as worship Jesus, who is the sacrifice of God, the Lamb of God. So they went on a field trip to Jerusalem. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them for he purified their hearts by faith. So here's Peter talking about his testimony. Man, I went to the Samaritans. I went to Cornelius' household. I'm just telling them about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit falls upon them. They start speaking in tongues and prophesying and everything. And I'm like, whoa, this is more than I expected. I think we should baptize them. God's already baptized them in the Spirit. Let's baptize them in water. They go, whoa, God's getting ahead of us. He's got his program. We're trying to work out what God is doing. So Peter is now telling this, this august group of leaders what his experience was. God was reaching out to the Gentiles through the Holy Spirit. But listen to this. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? What's the yoke? The Old Testament, the law. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Wow. This is an incredible decision for a group of folks who've been raised under the Old Testament law to be standing there going, we think something's happened in Jesus that has superseded hundreds and hundreds of years of Old Testament record. But we've still got a problem. How do we live? We've got no rules. These don't apply anymore. So the story continues. Therefore, we're sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality, you will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. There it is. There it is. All of the Old Testament has now been summarized. Avoid blood, eating meat from strangled animals, and sexual immorality. Farewell. 
After that, work it out for yourselves. Well, it just seems a bit crazy, doesn't it? Really? Work it out for yourself? So how do we live now that we are free from the obligations of the law? This is the big question for the New Testament church. Uh, and Paul, having already preached about this freedom, he now says this to a group of followers who are trying to wrestle what this freedom actually looks like. You see, if you're free from the law, it means you're free to do anything. Really? How does that work? Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. So here's Paul saying, yep, you're free. You're free from the law. You're free to do anything you want. But let's just think about that for a moment. God gave you your body. Isn't it good that you don't yoke it with a prostitute? Because this is what was happening in Corinth. These people were saying, well, we're free, so there's no problem, is there? When they were doing this thing called, a, called dualism, where they were separating the body from the spirit. You could do anything with your body. It wasn't a problem because it wasn't your body that goes to heaven. As long as your spirit was holy and sanctified and clean. Does that make sense? Yeah, not really, but that's what they were thinking. Okay, Galatians has a very similar sort of description. It says here, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. See how free they are? But don't indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. So we're a Spirit-led people. Yeah, the Old Testament helps us understand the values that God has, all the principles of holy living, but we don't please God anymore by keeping those laws. Why? Because Christ fulfilled the law. He lived it. It was completed in his life and he was put on a cross, and he died an innocent man. And that innocence has been credited to each one of us. The problem we have is this. If we think that our own righteousness, our own works, impress God, and therefore help us win our own salvation, we're saying that the cross of Christ was incomplete to save us. You see, the whole thing's a reversal. I, I'm enamored with Christ. I'm in love with Christ because of what he's done for me. What an amazing thing he's done. He set me free from the law. He set me free from death. And I look at him and I go, well, there's no more love that can be given to me. My life now is about living the life that he's called me to because I'm his child and he's made a way for me. Everything I do is now out of a response to the cross. I don't get up in the morning and go, oh boy, the cross won 80% uh, of my salvation. Today I've got to help some old ladies across the road. I've got to give some more money to the poor, you know, because I've got to make up that extra 20%, otherwise I miss out. No, my salvation is totally secure. Totally secure. It's been Christ won. And it's a gift for us. If we think we can earn our way to heaven in any form, even as we look at the cross, it's evil because it says that the cross was incomplete. Galatians 5.19. 
The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Okay? I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Let's just stop there. There's no limit to these things that we can do. You can take the fruit of the Spirit. You can take love, kindness, goodness, compassion, forbearance, which is perseverance, long-suffering. You can take all of these activities and you can do them as much as you want because there's no limit to them. There's no law against them. And it keeps on saying, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Okay, so we're now living a lawless life, which really summarized like this. It says, as the great Saint Augustine said, he said that you should love God and then do what you want. Hold on. Love God, do what you want. If you really love God, what you want to do will not be meeting the desires of the sinful nature, will it? It's like my relationship with my wife. I love, God, I love her and I do what I want. But I love her and therefore my life is centered around her. Hey, hon. You've got to say yes. <laughs> I just spent three days chopping wood. <laughs> All for you. Keep your toasty warm. You see, you love God and you do what you want. That's living by the Spirit. And being led by the Spirit, of course, is the empowerment of the Spirit. Um, and, and we're going to run out of time real quick, but let me give you an example of what this was happening, sorry, what was this was doing in the New Testament church. You remember in Corinthians, they had this real tension there about um, meat that was sacrificed to idols. Okay? So people would have a barbecue on a Saturday night, and uh, some new Christians all meeting together, and they're having a barbecue, having a fry up there, and somebody will say, um, where'd you get the meat from? Oh, I got it from Levi's down the road there, the butcher's. He goes, do you know that he gets his meat from the temple after it's been sacrificed to an idol? Uh, yeah, I did, actually. Well, well, why are you eating it? Well, I'm okay with that. Well, I'm not. So here we have two people, Christians, looking at the same issue and coming to different conclusions. And what we're told there is that we should respect the person with the weaker conscience. So if your friend has turned up and uh, doesn't like your barbecue because it's got meat and it's sacrificed to idols, that person has a weaker conscience. That's what Paul says. Okay? It's not a wrong thing. It's not a bad thing. But for that person to eat that meat, that's sinful because that, that affects their conscience. And they feel like it's something they shouldn't do for God. Yeah? So it's tofu burgers, you know? That's all it comes back to. Let me use an example of a more modern day thing. It's actually not so young these days, to show my age. But back in the 80s, early 90s, there was uh, a couple of All Blacks, Michael Jones and Vying Atui Gamala, two really, really strong Christian witnesses. Michael Jones wouldn't play rugby on a Sunday, whereas Vying Atui Gamala was happy to play rugby on a Sunday. The reason being is that for Michael and his family, particularly his mum, she was always strong about no sport on a Sunday. So Michael said, I'm not going to play sport on a Sunday. I want to honour God, honour my family, and that's the way it'll be. Whereas Vying Atui Gamala, he was happy to go and run out on a Sunday and play the game. And there is no tension between the two of them, no contradiction, because they were working things through and keeping with their own conscience. It wasn't that Michael Jones had decided that he was going to go back into the Old Testament and find the Sabbath laws and go, oh, of all the 603 laws, I've decided to keep that one. You know, well, there's a whole lot of laws about not eating shellfish, you know, the clothes you wear. It just goes on and on and on. He didn't just choose one and say, this will do, I like this one. See, it's, a, it's an issue of conscience. And the problem 
that we have about this freedom is that it is so free, it's scary. It really is scary. You see, we, we by nature, we like laws because then we know the boundaries, don't we? But when you've been told this is an issue of conscience and you've got to honour one another in this space, that's hard work because it drives us towards community. It drives us towards hearing each other's stories. It drives us to hearing each other's values and why it is that we do what we do. You know, one of the toughest things we ever did with our own children is when they were teenagers, we'd say to them, what time do you think you should come home by? They go, oh, 11.30? Go, yeah, okay, that's good. Or they might go, but later they might go, one o'clock? We go, yeah, if you think that's right, it's good, you do it. And they're always home on time. If I'd said one o'clock, they would have been in at quarter past. <laughs> that's just human nature. But we we're calling them up to maturity. Yeah, and that's what God's doing for all of us. See, if we can just live a set of laws and we walk around going, oh yeah, okay, God, we're good, I'm keeping the laws, aren't I? And he'll go, yeah, that's all fine. He goes, all right, I'll check in in a year or two and see if I'm busting any. But with a, a spirit-led relationship, we don't have a, a conversation with the law. We have a conversation with God. I was sitting in the supermarket last night. Um, Michaela was in getting a couple of things about seven o'clock in the evening. And I saw this um, couple just sitting in a camper van. You know, and that you could tell they were pouring over maps. And... Um, we got back and I said to Michaela, we should go and see if they want to stay at our place. You know, we just they can just park their camper van in the driveway. And uh, so Michaela went over and spoke to them. Now, they, as it happened, they, they needed to go somewhere else and Michaela helped them out. But um, you see, there's no law against that. There's no law against kindness. I didn't have to look at my law book and see if, I, if the Brazilians, who they were, were in the group of people that I'm not allowed to talk to. Yeah? Because that's the way it would have been in the Old Testament. They weren't allowed to associate with Gentiles because they were unclean and unholy. Our biggest challenge as Christians is coming to grips with the freedom that we have in Christ. And how do I use that to glorify God? So, the question is not what laws do I keep to fulfill God, fulfill God, but how do I love Jesus and how do I follow him? That's the reason why Christ came. It's so that we would be separated from law-keeping and driven towards a loving relationship with God and with each other as we are led by the Spirit to achieve what it is that God wants for you personally and for us corporately. And that's all I want to say. Because that's all there is to say. And I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing grace. I think it's beautiful that God would trust us. We make mistakes, but the cross has given us the ability to go back and, and seek restoration with God and get on again and be spirit-led, motivated by our desire to glorify him. I think it's the most astounding thing. And that's why the gospel is called Good news. That's what it's translated to. Now, look, some of you will have been raised in environments where you had this sort of um, half-baked presentation of law-keeping to keep God happy. Or maybe it was keeping the preacher happy, or maybe it was keeping mum and dad happy. Yeah? I was talking to a young lady once at a class I was teaching, and she said, yeah, Every Sunday, she said, there was a lady standing at the door of my church with a hand out like this, and we had to pull our chewing gum out of our mouth and stick it in. Because <laughs> you don't chew gum in the house of the Lord. Well, maybe you don't, but for her, that was heaven or hell. That was, don't give me your gum. You see what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying. Maybe you've been raised in an environment where this legalism speaks to you loudly and it's like the husband who never stops nagging. Yeah? Now, I'm talking to men here too. 
This isn't a marriage seminar now. But I'd like, uh, if that's been you, and you feel intimidated by God rather than loved by him, there'll be these traits of legalism that you've been raised with. It won't be your fault. It's just the way that God has been presented to you. That's the very reason why Christ came. Because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden. I will give you rest for your souls. Translated in more accurate English, when he says, I will give you rest for your souls, he's actually saying, I will give you a permanent vacation. (laughs) Do you like that? A permanent vacation from law keeping. So if you feel that you've been intimidated, um, I'm not going to invite you to stand on your own, but I just really want you to take the opportunity. I want to invite the music team out now. We're just going to wrap it up here. But, um, yeah, this message just breaks bondages, breaks strongholds, just allows us to see ourselves for who we are. So why don't we stand? Father, we, um, we want to acknowledge that the story that we're part of, where the church was born, was deeper and deeper and deeper than we ever understood. It challenges us at the very core of our being because that's what you want to know us. That's the level you want to know us at. You don't want us to be robots who just sort of be good, but to be your children who are engaged with you. And nothing separates us from you. And Lord, I just want to pray today and stand against those false images that we've created over years of of who you are, someone who, who speaks harshly at us, who demands, who intimidates, as opposed to Christ who embraced us and gave us what we need. So God, help us to come to grips with this freedom that we've been given. That freedom comes with huge responsibilities. And that means we've got to be big people. We've got to make our own minds up about things. We've got to work things through with others. We've got to respect and prefer others at times when their consciences don't allow them to do something. And yet at the same time, we balance that up by by not using our freedom to just indulge the flesh, but to recognize that we are your children and this is how we love you. And this is how we respond to you. God, I, I just want to pray for folks who, who haven't really crossed that line of faith. Who have wondered what it's all about. What does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus? Lord, let your yoke be easy, your burden be light. As they come to realize the sacrifice that was made on the cross for you to credit to us a death that we needed to separate ourselves from the, from the Old Testament and a resurrection that allows us to live a new life. So God, we, we bless you and we thank you. We're overwhelmed by this revelation and just help it define our walk with you as we move into more and more maturity with you. We ask all of this for Jesus' sake.